and we're live. Welcome everyone. My name is Macy. I am the host today. I'm the founder of Autism Career Pathways and today I have Sam Huber and we switch roles today. Usually Sam interviewed me and then now I get to interview Sam to chat about uh, all things fatherhood related, right? Yeah. So go ahead Sam, tell us about yourself. Uh, hey folks, uh, my name is uh, Sammy Huber. I got diagnosed with autism at age 14. Before that, it was nonverbal learning disability and, and ADHD without the H. Um, for those of you who often get this mixed up, nonverbal learning disability means that I couldn't read body language. I could talk, but I couldn't read like facial expressions or body language. Um, the other huge thing about me is that I been on a very long journey that I've turned now into my life mission, uh, which is to create a positive space to talk about autism and, pr and prove to the world that we can thrive and end all stigma, um, all stigma towards all autism if possible. And I'm doing that by cr creating an, I created a YouTube channel um, called, called just under my name, Sammy Heber, and I have three shows. Heroes of Autism, Inclusion Tube, and Adulting While well on the Spectrum. The first show is where I talk to other individuals who I invite on my show that are creating a positive experience for autistic people or they're autistic themselves and have found ways to thrive in this adult world. Um, Inclusion Tube is the official um, YouTube channel for Inclusion Festival, which is a festival geared towards autistic people and other people of, that are neurodiverse. And adulting while on the spectrum is where I share things from my past and current tips that I've learned to help me really thrive on a personal level as an adult. Uh, I write, right now I live in Pennsylvania with my wife, Josette, and my son, Sky, who's about to turn three next month. Um, and apart from that, I love camping, I love music, and I love connecting with people. Um, that's me. Yeah, thanks for sharing. You have so much good advocacy work out there, so I really admire you. Um, I wanted to ask you about your childhood, uh, like growing up, and since we're talking about dad, you know, just I wanted to check you back and see if you remember maybe moments of uh, you and your dad like having special conversations about your diagnosis or maybe your dad never told you specifically about the diagnosis but how is he like guiding uh -huh. you me and my dad have had a you know a you know wonderful relationship and he you know has always been on board of wearing it wasn't about not telling me it mm -hmm. was the fact that before i was 14 i got uh di diagnosed with adhd and nonverbal this is learned is because the doctors thought I was so high functioning that, oh, he can't have Asperger's or autism. And then I got re-diagnosed by a different doctor who then gave me the diagnosis at 14 because I was um, still struggling in school. But when it comes to my dad, my dad is someone who is always there for me at a drop of a hat. Uh, when people said I couldn't couldn't read or, you know, w w you know wouldn't form a deep deeper relationship with people, he sat with me and worked on those things with me, especially with the with my reading, because he's a writer, and mm -hmm. he was determined that Sam would learn how to read, um, and that Sam would be able to sound things out. And uh, eventually, he discovered that you know I, I can't. I have to visualize the word and memorize what the the physical word looks like in order to read it. So he worked on it with me and and helped visualizing r reading, and he got me a tutor to help with that as well. Um, and it's always just been such a positive relationship where he's always allowed me to go out and try new things, which is the philosophy that I do through my advocacy work and my public speaking is that in order for all these adults to thrive, that we have to actually go out and do adult things and, you know, take chances and make mistakes in order to learn what, what, what works best for us. And he's always honored that. Um, and right now we're working on, uh, actually writing a book about our relationship and uh, comparing how we saw things um, because back when I was in school they wanted to put me once I was diagnosed with autism they wanted to put me in a more intensive uh, schooling but my parents mm -hmm. were 
uh, the firm believed I only needed a little extra help in order to thrive, and they got me into a really good school for mostly Aspergery kids, um, which really helped me thrive. They let me go to Belize and Costa Rica for a school trip, and they, they really gave me opportunities to be independent. And so my experiences with my dad, you know, apart from that, are just typical throwing the ball back and forth, going yeah. to Phillies games, uh, watching the Eagles every Sunday. Um, and it's overall was a great relationship. Yeah. So, uh, your dad actually, uh, took the time to figure you out, not figure the autism out, but figure you out. Right. Yeah. So he, he invested time, um, to think outside of the box mm. and help you overcome you know, and that's really, really, really important. And he also didn't change the world for you, but instead he prepared you a little bit at a time to be able to go out there and live, you know, and I have goosebumps right now, just mm -hmm. kind of listening to your story and just, just trying to like summarize it because that's, you're very lucky, you know, mm -hmm. that you have your dad. And as you know, like you and me, we work with kids with special needs as mm -hmm. educators, and most of our students or clients are boys. Yeah. And, and yet, usually, uh, moms are the ones uh, on the fourth, you know, front, just, just like coming to meetings and schools mm -hmm. and asking all these questions. And usually, dads are in the background if we get to see them at all uh, right. I see that in my work uh, as a parent coach uh, but anyways you you I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you did you want to say something yeah uh, I just want to say that I think the huge thing about dads is like mm -hmm. um, they, they often go with the, the stereotype that you know mom's in charge when it comes to raising kids mm -hmm. and if dads are looking for a role which I think my dad certainly did. Um, he realized he was the role model for what a man's supposed to be. Um, so even if you, you know, any dads out there that feel, oh, like mom's handling all the uh, speech therapy, all the fine motor therapy or whatever you want to call it. And you're like, what do I do? Like just being yourself and including your child. Like my dad took me everywhere he went and made me feel included in the, in the world. I think that's a huge well, one parent should definitely feel, if not both, like someone who actually takes uh, their sons and daughters who are on the spectrum yeah. out into the world and show, show them how not to be afraid. Yeah. That's a really common role for the dads that are involved and want to do something. Um, and any dads out there that want to do something, that that's such a huge role. Because mm -hmm. um, often, you know, the, with special needs children, uh, the, there's a lot of hesitation, a lot of fear, the stigma or... They don't know what their child's going to do, but yeah. even if you're going out in public for five minutes and that's all your child can handle, like that, your child's threshold yeah. uh, will get better. It's like building a muscle is what I tell a lot of dads. Like, you know, you can't lift a hundred pounds on your first go when you're like 15, you never lifted the weight in your day, but yeah. you, know, so you start smaller and then you build up to that kind of heavy weight. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the secret to you know, being involved, helping your children work, work yeah. out in a way. Yeah. So, um, you've heard of saying the saying, uh, mothers nurture and fathers prepare. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's, that's so true because, uh, in your story, your dad, uh, shared his passion and his interest with you and he mm -hmm. took you, uh, through just his own experiences, enjoying all these things, you know, the outdoor, the games, you know, and that's really, really important, I think, for us to share to other dads. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't know how to practice the homework from the speech therapist, you know, like all these different therapeutic pieces that maybe your wife is able to do because, you know, uh, your partner is, uh, it has the time at home to practice and and because you're it, it could also be the other gender it doesn't have to be that specific or yeah it could be, specific. It could be, totally it could be either way yeah 
but there are ways that I think you can share the best of yourselves with your autistic son and daughter. And that's so important, you know, yeah. um, and that's and that, what your dad did. Yeah. The, the important things I would tell parents out there, just because we're not making eye contact yeah. or maybe saying something within context, we might be saying like, we are watching you. Right. We are listening to you. Uh, and the best way that you can, you know, help your child is not only help them play to your strengths, but show them how you play to your strengths. And as a couple, that is so huge, whether you have a special needs child or not. Uh, playing to your strengths is better. If your wife is, or partner, or whoever is mm -hmm. better at the school stuff, let them do the school stuff and the, and the therapy stuff. Okay. But then, you know, you do the social stuff. Like, you're, if you're street smart, like that that's your role because autism at the end of the day is about the struggle to communicate um it's like a history lesson for people like me it's not like something that we intuitively pick up like in our typical brain would mm -hmm. so like just take him take him to home depot with you take him to the circus take him wherever it is that you're going as, as long as you feel comfortable doing that and the other huge part is being consistent between you and your partner talking to each other all right, I'm re trying to reinforce this, that he can go to the circus with you if he completes all his work, uh, schoolwork, or he, um, as long as he completes his, his five minutes of therapy, of speech therapy, you get to have these little social excursions. Yeah. Um, and that way dads can be so reinforcing and yeah. a positive uh, role model for their sons. Yeah. So let's talk about communication. Um, it sounds like your mom and dad, they uh, communicated and tried to get on the same page. I think that's really important. And you do the best that you can. Of course, you will disagree from time to time. Uh, but I think for couples who recently get a diagnosis, that's a really uncertain time, scary time for them, right? Definitely. So. Um, I think that's where I think men's point of view versus women's point of view. I can only speak as a woman, as a mom, we tend to be very emotional mm -hmm. and maybe for males, you might process this new diagnosis in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, but I read a lot on Facebook about this, this different process, the different ways that moms and dad process getting a new diagnosis and that could add to that stress level mm -hmm. you know uh so do you have any suggestions for dads who are trying to process mm -hmm. this diagnosis of uh their two-year-olds three-year-olds that uh how can they best uh understand it uh make sense of it and just mo hopefully move forward in the way that's complementary to your wife's or your partner's, uh, you know, journey to get there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, for dads out there, I think the biggest thing that I've seen in my going on nine years in the f field and then going through it personally in my personal life, I think the hugest, hugest thing is like I get it that as men we have the instinct to, you know, pu you know puff out our chest and you know, be that soldier for our child and toughen them up in the process because our ego is saying that my, my son is not disabled and I, you know, and through tough love, I will, um, you know, get where he needs to go. And then when they're met with the challenges of autism and tough love doesn't work, it's um, the first thing you must do, fellas, like as hard as it is, you have to learn to leave your ego by the door whenever you're playing with your child, beating your child, teaching your child something, um, because their behaviors, is, it's not about you. It's not like they're trying to challenge you. Truly, they may hit you, they may bite you, they may spit on you, they may throw other bodily fluids at you, but it, it it's just a, a projection of their in, inner struggle to communicate. And the most important thing is you got to meet you, your child where they actually are and play to their strengths. Mm -hmm. um, that if you're, and remember that your child is a very visual thinker, that they think in pictures, not in words. So harsh words or stern words or whatever you want to 
call them like th that's and they're not going to process it that well at that age but they'll, they'll get there uh one thing i always tell dads is like you know any any like they always talk about how there are certain markers that kids have to eat they have to be talking by this age they have to be uh wiping their own butt by this age and yeah. all, all these like markers i, I want to say throw those markers out the window your child will get there and when i they say Hawaiian time, they'll get there when they get there. Um, and that's a huge thing. And what that's going to do for you is a te allow you to appreciate your child's words even more when they use them. Because neurotypical parents, I think, for forget how wonderful those are, but like how hard you fought to get your child to say, Daddy, I love you, mm -hmm. or ask for a cup of juice or anything. Like, how precious is that? And that you you're, you are going to have this amazing experience with your child, no matter where they are, especially low or high. They're going to teach you to really appreciate what it means to be human, and when the things that you took for granted growing up, you're going to realize, wow, I did some amazing things myself that I'm able to take care of myself, and now I'm able to take care of this, this amazing child that uh, can do great things, and like. No matter where they're on the spectrum, like there are a lot of famous people on the spectrum that you may admire and you don't know. That's right. Tim, Bur Tim Burton, John Lennon, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Tesla, Einstein, the guy who invented Pokemon. Um, Dan Aykroyd, Daryl Hannah. And, uh, Dan Aykroyd's another great one. <laughs> Temple Granite. Yes. Uh, there are so many. We, we, we've been here this whole time. Just back mm -hmm. in your day, it, we've, we've been called quirky or weird. There really wasn't, even in the 90s when I was growing up, like it was just, oh, they all have ADD. That was like autism was still like a faint whisper compared to where it is today. Um, but the huge thing is we've always been here. And who knows, maybe even you might be a little aspy yourselves because I've heard tons of stories that dads get while they're getting their son diagnosed. Like, oh my God, I do that too. And that, and what the beauty of that, and it's not something to be afraid of if you want to get yourself diagnosed, is that gives you stuff more in common with your son or your daughter. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, beautiful. And then that's the heart of human connection anyway, f shared interest. And that's what I would get your son or your daughter to focus on, really, is how to share interest, how to bond with them. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's just eating a, a bowl of chips together and watching the same train video that your That's son right. has watched a hundred times. Mm -hmm. like that that means so much to your your child that you spend time with them rather than yeah. rolling your eyes or being yeah. upset that they don't talk. Because right. um, there are so many devices out there, like things like talkies, uh, peck port. There's so many mm -hmm. alternative ways to speak sign language that your child will learn to talk in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, the key is just to find what works and right. have fun with it. That's yeah. the other thing. Have fun with finding a way that your child communicates best. That's right. So for autistics, as well as other neurological differences or diagnosis, it's really scary to come to this world, right? So yeah. I think what you were saying, you join their world and see the world through their eyes and do it in such a way that slowly they're gonna meet you halfway you know uh so i think that's that's a beautiful way to think about it um that's a really really good advice not to try to change this beautiful child mm -hmm. but just connect and invest and nurture the differences so eventually the differences becomes like something amazing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So what were some of the things that you used to love or maybe still love doing with your dad? Other than writing, I can't write, uh, I can't wait to read your book. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing me and my dad like to do is, or sports are the huge thing for us. Like we're from Philadelphia. So uh -huh. um, talking about the Phillies, Sixers and Eagles, hockey, not so much. Uh -huh. um, but talking about sports is a huge thing. Um, and the, the other part is just simple family time, having meals together. We, and when we had concerts before this, he would go to an occasional concert with me because music was really how I learned to actually connect with people and actually went out into society by myself. And he'd 
he would be the first one out when the council let out at one in the morning. He would, would be there waiting and pick me up. And he saw like this is a chance for Sam to connect with people. Because the great thing about concerts for me was I had something to talk about with strangers and make friends that way. Like, oh, what song are you hoping to hear tonight? Oh, oh, they played that last or I don't want to hear. Or yeah, I hope they play that again. Mm -hmm. um, it just it was a great play like learning area for me. Um, and then him taking interest in ways I'm willing to connect. Um, and that's the other huge thing I want to advocate for dads is throw the concept of normal out because there is no such thing. Like for example, um, one story I love to tell is in college, my sophomore year, I realized that no one knows who the hell they are. So my autism didn't make me that special. Mm -hmm. That I might actually have something to share in the experience, college experience of figuring out who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helped really bridge the gap. And I think that's the huge thing you can do for your child as they're getting older, as they're reaching college, is realizing what you're feeling as an autistic person is human. It's not, it's not, you're, just, you're expressing your own way. It's just as I express it my way through going for a run when I'm angry. Yeah. Or, your, and your child does that through their special interests or uh, stimming like they're like and there's just it's the, it's the appreciation of differences there that it builds trust because that's the huge thing for people like me we want to know that you trust us like any child wants the, the parent to yeah. trust them yeah so, and it's, and by doing these shared interest activities my dad was able to build trust with me mm -hmm. and it, it taught me how to trust other people and um and Britain, that's how you he was able to help me bridge the gap with my communication issues too. Yeah. Well, he, he helped you to be a really good apprentice through just doing these activities so yeah. that you can be an apprentice to other people mm -hmm. as you grow up, as you grow up. So that's really important. Okay, Sam, um, we want to talk about, uh, discipline. Uh, for dads. So I get asked this question a lot. Well, uh, for example, one dad said, well, I was trying to give my son a hug and he just slapped me really, really hard. And that's not a normal, like three-year-old behavior. So this mm -hmm. dad got really upset and he did a time and all that. And mom got really upset. So, so I'm sure this happens a lot in any families, right? Um, what's your take on dads and how they should uh, implement discipline? Uh, um, that, you know, as you know, it's been up for debate since the beginning of time, I think with parents, but you know, are you authoritarian? Are you somewhere in the middle? Are you someone who, you know, tries to be your kid's best friend and gives in every time? Um, it's, it's a very tricky balance, but when it comes to autistic children, especially ones that most of us struggle with one key concept of human interaction, being able to tell uh, one's own feelings versus another's, uh, being able to tell uh, whose actions in the, the situation affected the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like uh, that dad who, who got slapped by his son, it was the fact that his son probably was not expecting the hug. Um, and yeah. also sudden movements like coming in so fast um the big thing for dads to understand is your child's processing is about imagine like five to 30 second delay like a delay like you know the buffering on your computer is going mm -hmm. and and then they process so it's really important to let your kid know you're what you're about to do especially a child on the spectrum you, you know no matter how you know run in the mill you think it is like giving a child a hug like that the big thing that you need to understand as that control is a huge thing for autistic children because they're anxious because of their sensory issues, anxious because of their social anxiety, anxious what's going on with their with their bodies because uh, um, we have, often have a lot of misinformation of what we're feeling through any of the five senses. So it can be very um, con confusing. And so when it comes to disciplining your child when they hit you, of course it's never okay to lay your hands on another human being. Or, or say nasty things, but the key thing is options. The key way to get them to understand right from wrong, especially for a black and white thinker like an autistic child, to get to understand those abstract ideas, mm -hmm. is if you do this, 
this is what happens. So you can make a choice either, you know, be, you know, kind and, you know, communicate with me or, but if you hit me, you don't get what you want. You don't, you know, holding them accountable that way. That appropriate behavior gets, you know, gets them what they want, not, uh, okay, we, he's been in a meltdown for five hours. I'm just going to give in. Um, so I guess in peace and quiet, like as much as, and I've been there, I've been on the front lines. I've taken as many punches as you guys have over the years. So I get how frustrating that is, how mentally exhausting that is. But if you give in after those five hours, the, the what you were teaching your child is if I throw a fit, no matter how long it is, I get what I want. And then next time they want, say a cookie is the reason for that done. The first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna slap you because last time I slapped dad, I got my cookie after he at first said no. Right. Um, so the, the, the hugest thing is to dig down deep and realize it is not personal what your child is doing. It's not because you're a bad dad or a good dad or uh, a, a good mom or good dad, whatever you mm -hmm. are in the relationship with your child. It is really about getting your child to help understand who they are as a person and connect with themselves. And the way that I think is the best representation is choice. All right, if you want your child to do math homework, but he says, you know, F no, dad, you know, F off. <laughs> uh, you can give him option. Well, I know how much you love that Xbox, um, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to ha have to not let you use it until your work's done. Or you can, you know, do homework and take Five, quick five minute br breaks in between so until it gets done and yeah. in those little breaks we can do we can talk about sports or just something very quick reinforcing mm -hmm. uh, until it gets done and then you can have the xbox or if you choose not to do your homework all, there's no xbox and no fun little breaks and yeah. we can just sit here mm -hmm. and that will probably lead to you know i'll be honest some serious meltdowns but if mm -hmm. at the end of that meltdown you the child is soothed down and calm again. Like, you get, and then go over the choices. Hey, if you complete this work, you get you get X. Yes. Um, and it, it's just holding them to that. Like, you don't need to raise your voice. In fact, I would wouldn't recommend raising your voice unless right. it's a life or death situation. You're trying to yeah. keep them out like the road, because a lot of children on the spectrum have hearing sensitivity. Yeah. So they're gonna react aggressively or run away from you, not on what you're saying. With the loud tone of your voice because that's gonna be very overwhelming it's like someone took a um bullhorn and just blasted in your ear even if you think you only raised your voice an octave or two like even that slight variation can be very jarring uh for someone on the spectrum yeah so be so when you're disciplining your child be aware of their what kind of sensory things they are so if you know you're in a bright room and your child has light sensitivity like i do i wouldn't recommend discipline your child there like wait until uh you're dim the lights or get some way to block that out or something that would would distract them so that you know that they're hearing you mm -hmm. uh, and that also teaches self-regulation which will the, um that's the hugest thing when you want to see the violent behavior go down is remaining consistent with with your demands right or should you I, don't use the word demand demand sounds it's gonna be very hard for a kid like you I suggest to you, Jimmy, that we do do your homework and then you can have Xbox. Yeah. Um, and th that's the hugest thing. It, it is about meeting them with that respect that, oh, I know math is really hard for you, but how can we break that down into chunks? Like five minutes of work, then a minute break. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and they can play with their fidget toys for a whole minute and, they, and then five minutes on again until the work is completely done. And then they get the big reward, which is like Xbox. Or if your child is lower on the function, their favorite food. Um, and the key thing, again, is do not give them the, the like the, the treasure chest until the work is done, I, is a good metaphor. Don't open the chest until everything's completed. Yeah. Um, and if you're working on behavioral issues and then having a reward for being good, um, I also would start off with like percentages, like if, and they, you know, keep track, like if eight out of 10 times they behaved correctly, give them the reward or at least a portion of it. So they know that they're headed in the right direction, but they're below like 80%, um, they don't get it. 
and then go over that. Like, see, when you when you go past this line, you get it. If you don't, if you're under it, you don't get it. like creating visuals like that. You could create like uh, a choice board on the wall where you just, if you get six stars, you get play Xbox. But if you only get five stars, you don't. That very clear distinction of uh, you have to do X amount or, or an X amount of stars in order to get it. But mm -hmm. if there's that one time you're like, oh, but they really tried hard and they get five notes, you still do not give them the reward because you have to, like, we're all, especially as children, we're very black and white. It has to be one way or the other because then the child, like, oh, I only have to earn five stars. Last time dad gave me the prize. Why do I have to earn six this time? And that, would, that could reintroduce the problem behaviors because you let them off the hook that one time. Yeah. Yeah. And but if they're having a really hard time trying to get the six star, offer ways to self regulate. Take a break. Uh, lift laundry up and down the stairs. Physical activity is really great to help self regulate and you know get back to center. Give them mm -hmm. healthy alternatives, not the prize. Because the prize is for completing the task, for behaving the way you want them to behave. And that's how you discipline them. It's not through locking them in their room for a timeout or. Um, and also the huge thing, if you're still worried about the physical aggression, which is, can be really bad, I get it. Um, take safety care training, what, whatever your, your school is doing, like ask them, hey, um, where can I learn to do that? And get certified yourself so you know how to handle and de-escalate your child in those really hectic situations that are so bad. Yeah. And that way you, you're not disciplining your child, you're working with your child helping them learn to self-regulate and how to make better choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are really good tips. It sounds like, uh, but I think the number one tip, keep in mind for dads, is that you've got to take a moment to reflect. Mm -hmm. So when we do have bad days, you know, and we feel like we're failing as a dad or as a mom, those are the time that uh, we should take a moment to just just regroup and think back so that we have a better plan next time because <laughs> we got to have like a rough draft right mm -hmm. for next time i mean because otherwise the same thing might happen again mm -hmm. right um so uh yeah any other tips this is my last question mm -hmm. do you have any tips or words of wisdom for dads with little kids who just received a diagnosis. Okay, for the dads out there who just got their kid diagnosed, um, take time to take care of yourself is the first tip. And and always keep up with self-care, no matter where your child is on the spectrum, dad, and even neurotypical dads out there that may be watching, take care of yourself first. Um, because then you are in a, a grounded place and you can choose to make decisions out of love for your child rather than the frustration and the ang anger that come with like mm -hmm. why is my child different uh, the huge thing is guys remember there's no such thing as normal that everyone is different you're different your wife different any of you both are neurotypical you both mm -hmm. are two completely different people and autism is no different in that way it's the best way to look at it is its own culture its own mm -hmm. language its own its own social norms it has its own things like pretend you're on vacation and you're you, you're dropped in the middle of like Mexico, Russia, or wherever, and you have to learn a whole new language. And a lot of experts will will tell you the best way to learn a new language is to be in a situation where they only speak that language. So put yourself in situations where they only speak autistic, and learn yeah. how your child communicates. For example, uh, where we hold our hands on our body can tell you how we're feeling. This is for high functioning, middle functioning, and low functioning kids on the spectrum. The higher my hands go, the more stressed out I am, or the more happy I am. Um, it's different for every child, but if you watch your hands and then ask them what were you feeling afterwards, if you can, they'll say, I'm happy, and then make a middle note or write down, okay, when Johnny's hands are here, happy, but when he's touching his face and picking at his face or pulling his hair, he's stressed. Mm -hmm. um, that's our own body language, and they're all these little minutiae of learning how your child communicates and expresses him or himself. Um, that we, when we talk, we have to move our bodies. Like, there's no, like, sit calmly and uh, look someone in the eye. Like, I also would drop that, the whole thing with eye contact. Maybe eventually they'll get there. I, I learned through counting to three and I go back to somebody's eyes when I'm talking to them. 
or simple things like that, or just know the fact that we are listening and we're concentrating on listening to you rather than looking at you because we know as creatures, creatures, human beings are all about communicating with each other. We're more focusing on receiving the message from you rather than am I looking at dad? Am I reading his body language? And, and that those are two different things that won't go hand in hand till your child is older, that they'll learn to read body language uh, phase. And even then it gets hard, but the key is visualize. Your child visualizes everything. The best way I can describe this way your child mind works is you know how Google works. You, you go on Google, you type in uh, Jennifer Aniston and then a million photos yeah. pop of, of, of her. Um, if I, and then if I say the word miracle, what comes up in my Google is like a picture of Jesus healing a leopard or uh, walking in the water. Like this image comes into my mind, like a, like yeah. a flood of images. And I pick that image. And that's the huge thing is you want your child to have the power of choice. So having your, making your world visual, uh, being very descriptive and what, and being specific and what you want from your child mm -hmm. helps them use their Google engine. And I love some, that. Yeah, I got that from yeah. Temple. So <laughs> oh, I love uh, that. <laughs> it's uh, like this. It's like autistics planet. It's very, very adventurous. And mm -hmm. for the rest of like the rest of uh, people, there's mm -hmm. no express trains to go there. There's only the steam engine where you have to enjoy the views and, right. and then you get there. Some people do, some people don't, you know, but hopefully we all, you know. Yeah, and then a, a, a visualization that I also help dads do if they really want to understand is um, don't talk for a, a, day, a day of silence and just, you only communicate through images. So you can only take your phone, right? And, oh, you want to express something? You can only use Google images. And that you can only to express yourself towards your wife, your, your children, and that's kind of how your child's brain works. Uh, and then the next day you can add your words back in, like I image like of, um, oh, oh she, is she making meatloaf? A picture of uh, meatloaf and, he, and, he point, and I'm pointing to that. And then the next day, honey, are you making meatloaf again? <laughs> uh, the reason why you break it up into two different days is, is to see that the words come second, but for a neurotypical person, words come first. So it gives you an opportunity to be in a world where everything in the way you think is in reverse. Yeah. And then once you get that, and once you're able to figure out how to teach that to your child, that this is how your brain works. You think in images, their language, uh, whether it's through devices or through their own mouths will pick up. The more reason they watch the same video over and over again is they're trying to learn how to talk, but through images, like how the train moves and they'll mimic the sounds because they're visualizing the way that train is moving, the way the wheels are turning. Mm -hmm. um, like sound and speaking is secondary to us in our communication. It's what we see that comes first. Right. Um, that's why we have such incredible memories. That's why we experience everything through, through our, our ability to see things in images. And, and it even comes to how we read, we see, we see the physical page of the word, not the word itself. We have yeah. to learn how the reader word by memorizing what that word looks like. Yeah. And they're just, the biggest step is spend some time in your child's world. Um, and if your child has hear sensitivity, uh, play really loud music while you try to complete a simple task, like death metal, like just turn it up as high as it go and then try to complete a task. And that's what it's like for your child with hear, hearing sensitivity. Uh, think of, and then when it comes to taste like getting a child to try new foods um think of the thing that you, you can't stand the taste of and then put down everything that you love and enjoy and then you can understand how sensitive our taste is or the fact with the re when you try to teach yourself to eat a whole new food try that if you're like oh i hate brussels sprouts. But if you eat little by little when you trust it a bit more and taste it a bit more that food is about trust everything um that also a child does is about building trust with the world around them so for food, yeah. and food's an early one for a lot of dads. Like, why won't I can't get my child to eat anything but like popsicles or like we have these very weird diets that our kids get fixed on. It's because with processed foods, especially children on the spectrum, know that processed foods will taste the same way every time. But something yeah. you cook varies, and that inability to know and control what something tastes like 
can be scary for myself included. I was a very picky eater until my wife learned if I just cook the same way, Sam will start eating. Well, I'm trying to get him to eat more and more. She put a little bit on my plate and build it up. And this is me in my mid twenties, but I eventually learned to love and like vegetables and eat them on a regular mm-hmm. basis through building trust with it. That everything for us is an emotional response. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we have an emotional attachment to daily living from brushing our hair, brushing our teeth, the clothes we wear. Oh, that's too itchy. We have an emo- rather than, oh, I'll just change our shirt. We have a big emotional response to it. Yeah. It's so itchy. And the, the key is that when your child gets older is there's a time and place to stim. Not, and, and never be ashamed that you do that because that's mm-hmm. you. Like I stim at work all the time. I, but I go into the bathroom and I stim in the bathroom with my fingers or my way home when I don't care what people think of me while I'm dancing to music my own in my own way mm-hmm. and that's the that's the key is your child just wants to know that, they, that you accept them even if you can't talk to each other at least in the way you think you can talk to each other and that you're making an effort to learn their world that's how your child on a spectrum knows that you love them and that's a question i hear from parents time again how can i know if my child doesn't hug me or kiss me or say i love you how can i know uh, it's when you step into their world and you start to see their, the way they're excited, excited with the hand flapping. If you walk in the room, and your child's doing this excitedly. They're excited to see you. Um, yeah. And, the, and, the, you, and they, but they might not approach you. You know, like most children, they would run up and hug you by their legs. Your yeah. child will express that through their own language. Yeah. And so we should join the stim party. Yeah. Stimming, it's a lot of fun, right? Jumping. Just, Jumping. Yep. Yeah. It's just, it's just, and, the, and if parents want to know why we do that, it, it's the same thrill as going for like a run. Right. It's the same way that help when you go for a run, your head gets cleared up and right. you're able to process your thoughts that help exercise clears the mind. That is this, that's what STEM behavior is. It's yeah. our ability to process information through our whole body. And so creating a time and safe place to do it is showing your child respect that you had, you know, if you, it's the same thing as your hobbies. Oh, I, I go shoot hoops with my friends at this time every week. Oh, at this time every week, your child will stim with their toys, or listen to music or with their hands. Um, I know some of the, some of the simming can be aggressive and that's why you, the, the, working with them on making better choices, like what are healthy ways to stim? It's the same way of healthy ways to communicate versus bad ones. Kids are, you know, a-holes to each other. But as we get old, we learn to, be nicer to each other right. and there's no more you know, bullying for the most part as we get older yeah um, with you know some exceptions but yeah and that, that's the same thing that like building your child up um, and you'll yeah. see a lot more progress like right. it's, it's when we know that we're accepted no matter if we spent like two weeks beating the crap out of you um, the fact that you are still there and still fighting and for me and strength and trying to help me make better choices yeah. Uh, I've seen it time again with my younger clients, the fact that my parents didn't give up on me. And they knew, you know, they, they learned it wasn't personal. And then it comes back to parents, take care of yourselves. I yeah. know that you feel you need to be on top of your child 24 7 because they have autism, but no, let them, you know, if you need some time yourself, let them be on the iPad for an hour while you go shower or take a bath or walk the dog, you know. Like take that, that time for yourself. Even if yeah. it, you're like, oh, I don't have time between work and my child. Take five minutes. Yeah. Everyone has five minutes to take yeah. care of themselves in some small way. Yeah. Do, there are five minute yoga practices that really ground you. Try that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, That's a very, very good tip, Sam. Thank so you. So how do people find you? Uh, people can find me on, on Instagram through Heber Family adventure they can find me on uh youtube as samuel huber um where i'm running my three shows they can contact me at samuel huber 77 at gmail.com which is on my instagram if in case someone did not hear that my email is there um and the best way is through instagram these days that's where i'm heavily working through yeah uh or leave a comment on youtube or just a straight up email I'm open to talking to anyone who wants to hear more of what I have to say, or they're really struggling in their, Sam, how can I take care of myself while my autistic child is doing X, Y, and Z? Yeah. 
Yeah. I got a million and a half tips for you guys, and I'm happy to hear your stories and help you out in any way I can. Thank you so much, Sam. This has been such an amazing, amazing interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.